हेलो नमस्कार 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 माय नेम इज पूजा द्विवेदी वेलकम टू माय क्लास दिस इज द थर्ड क्लास ऑफ द हाई वैल्यू टॉपिक्स फॉर द यूपीएससी मेंस एग्जामिनेशन 2023 द सब्जेक्ट इज इंटरनेशनल रिलेशंस आई हैव ऑलरेडी टेकन अप टू क्लासेस इन व्हिच आई हैव कवर्ड सेवन मेजर टॉपिक्स एंड इन टुडेस क्लास वी आर गोइंग टू कवर टू टॉपिक्स इंडियाज रिलेशनशिप विद अफ्रीका ओवर द इयर्स एंड द कंटेम्पररी टाइम्स and india's relationship with west africa do not worry about making notes because i provide the notes in the form of pdf through my telegram channel that is by the name of pooja divedi upsc you can search for it and join it to get the pdf other than this if you're appearing for the upsc 2024 it is of utmost importance that you be stuck to this particular class because all the classes that are given will help you for the mains examination 2024 as well all right as this particular subject is very dynamically inclined more than static you have to ensure that you are updated with the dynamic part so here i am of course helping you in that or from that perspective all right so of course before i begin i would want to inform you about another very important announcement the p2i batches which have garnered a lot of positive response from the students study iq has brought yet another batch from the 11th of september these batches will go from 8 am onwards on a daily basis we have three separate batches and according to your need according to the suitability of your own language you can choose either hindi or english or even english these batches will not only help you for your prelims examination mains examination but also for the interviews like many coachings give you csat separately ethics separately language papers are not even available in certain coachings we are going to provide you all that in the p2i batches so it's a very important and efficient batch that you must join and test series mains answer writing practice current affairs module everything is included even a mains residential program is there if you are able to qualify upsc prelims 2024 you will be called to the study iq campus so that you can prepare there for your mains examination for 4 months no elevated charges are there you just have to use the code pd live so that you can get this particular batch of 70000 at just 29999 use this code pd live pd live is also available for any other courses that are available on study iq and these batches will be live in nature that means you will be able to interact with the teachers so now let's finally begin with the first topic for today that is india and africa africa the second largest continent in the world which has a huge demographic dividend untapped potential of natural resources it is important from the perspective of security in the indian ocean as well what interests could india have in africa through africa india can show that it is a power which can become a bridge between africa and of course the rest of the world specifically the west whenever we are talking about the international relations we have to think from certain perspective these per- perspectives ranges from first we have trade trade relations between india and africa from trade we will also get connectivity it's also interconnected right if we are talking about in connectivity we have to ensure that there is security so another point is security any country with which we can have a relationship also helps us to show our goodwill to the rest of the world so india as an emerging voice for the global south we can call it india india's goodwill whenever all these things rise trade connectivity goodwill people to people contact this makes sure that a country is able to have a soft influence in these many countries it's a grouping of so many countries it's a continent filled with so many countries such vibrant countries so india needs to ensure that it taps the potential energy is also one of the very important things that india is concentrated upon 
Now, in a volatile world like we are living today, India needs to diversify its energy demands. We are being dependent on one country or the other for most of our energy needs. And as I told you, that Africa remains an untapped potential. So, India needs to ensure that it is investing in Africa in such a manner that not only India benefits, but also the continent of Africa as a whole benefits. All right. So, I hope you get the pillars of it. Now, let's talk about the significance through certain data. It is home to over half a dozen of the fastest growing countries in the world, such as Rwanda, Senegal, Tanzania, even our BRICS partner, South Africa. Not only that, the real GDP in Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in the past few decades have doubled. If we compare them to the year 1980s and 1990s, this is the, this is the arena, this is the current situation that countries which were considered underdeveloped or developing, we are changing that entire scenario and the narrative of the West. We saw that how the African countries majorly, if we talk about South Africa, now it wouldn't bog down to the threats of the West, to the sanctions of the West. It is of course concerned about diversifying its own choices as well. And India provides a good alternative. If we compare India with China, China does have inroads, but India provides a good alternative. So we can always ensure that trade relations grow. A population there is there of 1 billion people. Combined GDP of 2.5 trillion dollars. It's a huge market for us. We can invest in manufacturing facilities. We can train the people of Africa. We can market our soft power through commercial films, through songs, through collaboration. So much, so much untapped potential remains for India in the continent of Africa. It's a resource rich nation. It is a good resource of crude oil, gas, pulses, lentils, leather, gold and other metals. Most of the countries have exploited Africa. They never explored Africa. They always wanted to have a one-sided benefit, specifically the West. But India wants to ensure that it does, it does not see Africa from that prism. It sees Africa as a point of convergence, as a point or as a group of countries which is able to back India when India talks about reforms. So political convergence is needed, mutual benefit is needed. On all these many things, India is trying to work with Africa. So Namibia and Niger, if we know, it is the top 10 global producer of uranium. When India looks for energy, nuclear energy, civil nuclear energy is the most important one in the basket of India's energy mix. So that is why we need to develop relationship with those countries which are able to provide India with the correct nuclear fuel. And these countries, of course, from Namibia, we got our cheetahs. Maybe in the times to come, we can have an arrangement, a proper arrangement to get such resources from countries such as Namibia. South Africa is the world's largest producer of platinum and chromium. Africa can play a, an important role in the energy, India's energy matrix. We do not need to be dependent on only one country. We have to diversify our interest. This is not only in the case of India, but other countries are also looking to diversify interest. Not only Africa, but West Asian countries as well. Now, there are certain challenges, of course. Challenges in Africa as a whole and challenges in the relationship between India and Africa. Those, both the points will be discussed. Challenges and in Africa entail the issue with demographics, the issue with economy, politics and society. Right now, we are seeing a lot of coups are happening. First Niger, then Gabon. Sudan is also having military issues. Other than this, countries such as Ethiopia, Central African Republic, they are in perpetual issues. There are regional rifts as well. There is issue with respect to Tigray region between Ethiopia and Tigray and thereafter Eritrea as well. 
so these countries when they are unable to resolve their issues at a diplomatic scale what will happen like minded countries cannot be together like minded countries i'm talking about india being a democratic country it cannot interact with those countries which are working in a manner of coup or military usurping of power it becomes hard to interact then competition is there and there are many external players as we know that the wagner group still is very very active in africa china has been one of the most important players the usa russia so of course these many players when they come together to fulfill their own interest do they really see africa fulfilling its own interest no not at all and when there are so many countries involved it becomes hard to build a single narrative which would help india in the long run any country in which china has a huge interest china is pumping a lot of money in those countries will china want a narrative to be in, in those countries to be favorable for india or not similarly we can talk about the russia the russian federation usa so when there are so many players it becomes hard for interaction then of course most of our issues or most of our interest i would call it not issues is from the security perspective as africa has a huge coastline in the indian ocean if we have to trade with this particular continent we need to ensure that this area is free of any sort of single country's domination here we can talk about china we can also talk about countries in uh, which actually uh, ensure that piracy takes place over here those countries or those organizations which give rise to militancy so our major interest is in the indian ocean that means most of the countries that have a coastline with the indian ocean are most important so from that perspective as well in djibouti when china opened its port the concerns were high the concerns were high that if china is now opening ports in these countries it is trying to be dominant in the region of africa when there is an economic vacuum that country definitely will see economic imperialism economic imperialism is or new imperialism is taking the advantage of the fact that economically a country is not very well so china comes into the picture china says take our money and i will build a port take this money as a loan you pay me back when that port becomes operational if it doesn't become operational for some reason or the other i will take siege of that port china does it very well and here we have to see that india as a country has to show these countries that we are a better alternative to china so that china's presence in the indian ocean through africa gets reduced china is trying to entangle india in its string of pearls having ports in those specific countries that are having a literal state of the indian ocean so india needs to act fast india needs to act quick ethiopia is a landlocked country but it wants to ensure that it has a port it is in talks with many other countries so india can come into the picture whenever trade relations occur whenever the point of trade relations occur between ethiopia and india and of course brics has now expanded ethiopia is not uh, ethiopia is now also a part of the brics it is a part of the brics plus and just calling it plus because right now we do not have a name brics plus is actually not the official name so do not write brics plus in your examination paper it's brics which is expanded we do not know about the nomenclature that it is going to take brics was supposed to be a five country grouping brazil russia india china south africa now six more countries have come and in which egypt and ethiopia are also a part so ethiopia when it is looking for a port and brics is a coalition of economies why shouldn't india help ethiopia this 
is a golden opportunity for India. If India takes a part into that, if India talks with other countries which are able to provide access to Ethiopia, it can do wonders for India. Then, China's involvement I have explained to you for the Indian Ocean. But China has remained the Africa's largest economic partner. That is since 2000. Not only in infrastructure development, but upskilling, resource providing and financing. All these have been taken care of by China. Why? To increase the influence. To increase the image of China as a power that is reliable. But we know that who is the more benevolent power. China is doing it for, for its own gains. India does it for the gain of both the parties. Okay. Now, significance of India for Africa. How is India significant for Africa? We talked about Africa's significance for India in depth. Now, we will also discuss how is India significant for Africa. India is significant in many matters. The image of India right now has been cemented as such. That India is rising as a voice or the voice of the global south. The global south which is a terminology, which is a geopolitical terminology. In order to explain that certain countries, most of the countries of the south are poor in nature. As in they are either developing or underdeveloped. So when these countries, if they are termed as economically inferior, it is easy to sway them away with economic power. India has acknowledged that even though these countries right now, they are underdeveloping or develop, uh, you know, developing or underdeveloped, but still they have a lot to, a lot of potential to show. So India never made them feel inferior. India has always been receptive of multilateralism, calls for multilateralism, reforming the United Nations Security Council for more presentation. So India's image has been cemented. Why? Because of its de dexterous approach to the Russian-Ukraine war. India initially drew the ire of countries such as the USA, Australia, Japan, when it wasn't condemning, openly condemning Russia. But later on, through its neutral stance, neutral but not aloof. Neutral in the sense that we are not going to put fuel to the fire by providing you arms, by providing any sort of condemnation openly. We are just going to ask you to solve the issue diplomatically. It drew the ire of many countries for not openly condemning, condemning Russia. But later on, all these countries, they are still putting India at a pedestal which no country has ever seen. Why? Because of our own policy, because of our own dexterity. And that is not, you know, right now you wouldn't see that in any other country. India has historically enjoyed a close relationship with Africa. That is definitely true. There is the desire, convergence of desire for more representative institutional world bodies. And Africa has called for it time and again. There is support for Africa's Isilvini consensus, which talks about, you know, changes and reformation in the councils, United Nations Security Council or other world body. Climate issues, here India and African nations refuse to be West sacrificial lambs in the sense that we do not now want to be dependent on any other country for providing us technology. We do not need to be, we do not want to be dependent on any other country for providing us aid. India is coming at a position through its own technology that it can provide it to Africa. Here, India can stand out the most because these countries have been at the receiving end of all sorts of climate menace, be it drought, be it issues with respect to flooding, be it issue of any kind. So, when it comes to climate, so India can be a technology provider. India is doing really great when it comes to the nationally determined contribution. Here, India is making sure that it becomes Atmanirbhar and then it can flow this Atmanirbharta to other countries as well. Mutually beneficial commercial interests are there. This can be seen with the uptick in activity by India's corporate heavyweights. They are investing a lot in different sectors. 
IT, farm, management, hospitals, schools, exploration of natural resources, and what not, artificial intelligence, climate resilience. Space exploration is also one of our aims. Recently, at the BRICS summit, the Prime Minister at the launch when we successfully soft landed on the south pole of the moon, India cemented its position as a huge spacefaring nation with a track record of success. And India did call for a space exploration consortium to be developed by BRICS, of which South Africa is a part. And now Ethiopia and Egypt is also a part. So with these countries, we can also work in the areas and arenas of space exploration. India is leading the way. Since April 1996, India has invested $74 billion in Africa. Mostly, it is concentrated in Mauritius and those countries which lie close to the Indian Ocean region, of course, because of the security challenges. But it is majorly done by the public sector company in areas such as energy and raw material. India is now attempting to offer a compelling alternative to China. China's reputation is being sullied right now. New Delhi must avoid framing the Africa strategy from the perspective of China because nobody will like it. Nobody will like that the interest of India in the African continent, of course, the interest of India in Africa is not dehyphenated from China. We cannot bring a dispute of our neighbor, the dispute we have with our neighbor to any other continent. Because what will happen? It will become a war front. It will, Africa will become a new war front between China and India and other players. And whenever more countries are included in one war front, we all know what happens. Nobody benefits in the long run. So, India has long been a leading troop contributor to the UN peacekeeping missions in Africa. We can, of course, capitalize on these matters. As you see, Indian investments in Africa can go up to $150 billion by 2030. This is a news from the last year itself. Now, what do we have to take care of in our relationship with Africa? I talked about issues with Africa as a whole and tangential issues that India has from the core problem of Africa. We now will talk about the issues we have with Africa vis-a-vis -vis our relationship. First, Indian businessmen must overcome the fear factor. The fear factor that investments in Africa are not worth it. There are so many disputes that we do agree that if coups occur in nation by nation, one after the other, it becomes hard for anybody to invest. But India can do it by leading the way through the public sector. After that, we can also incentivize the private sector. Right? The thing which we need to address secondly is racism. There have been reports of Nigerian students getting attacked in New Delhi. So, whenever racism occurs, that sullies the image. China's image has already been sullied. China's image is really bad right now when it comes to the handling of racism in their own country. The next thing is made in India cough syrup scandal that happened. When children died after consuming the cough syrups which were manufactured in India. Are they being used, are the children of Africa being used as experiment rats? This is what the image goes out in the world. Even if this hasn't been the case, but the image when it is maintained by the West through a propaganda, it could do so. So, all these have, of course, taken a toll on the relationship. Another important problem is domestic politics. Right now, as we see, that the domestic politics has become heavily inclined towards nationalism. Nationalism is good. Nationalism is not bad. But if it is pronounced on the basis of one religion, if it is enunciated or made more exaggerated on the basis of one particular religion, the image of that country starts to go down on a global scale. Because African countries, majorly they, they are Islamic countries, majorly. So what kind of image India wants to present in the nation 
can also be gauged from the fact that its image in domestic politics, its own domestic politics should not translate into international politics. We have to take care of these many things. Now, the way forward is we have to strengthen political and diplomatic cooperation through the India-Africa Forum Summit. We have to restore it. We have to make sure that it is more regular in nature. More regularity promises more success. We need AU's full membership in the G20 in the particular summit that is going to happen. India can call for it because why shouldn't the African Union be represented? It's a global economic forum formulated in 1999. It has the presence of the European Union. Why not the African Union? So India can lead the way. We need a dedicated secretary in the Ministry of External Affairs for African Affairs so that we can send a message to Africa that we take the relationship very seriously. And hence, we want to have a dedicated approach towards the strategy. Now, enhanced defense and security cooperation, definitely, for sure. To in we need to increase the number of defense attaches in Africa, of course, in order to check the expansion of other countries in Africa. We need to do that for our own security. We need to strengthen maritime collaboration and extend lines of credit to facilitate defense exports. Also, we need to undertake a lot of maritime drills with the countries that are specifically present in the Indian Ocean region. We need to have drills with respect to counter-terrorism, piracy and new kind of emerging cyber security threats. Because Africa needs upskilling as well. So India can lead the way there as well. Deepen economic and development cooperation. We need to promote the trade that India has with the African Union. We need to create uh, an Africa growth fund. Again, all these moves send a message how serious a country is about any relationship. We need to improve project exports and enhance cooperation in the shipping domain. This can be done through drills. This can be done through corridors being developed. This can be done through developing ports. And also, we have to ensure that whenever China is present somewhere, although India doesn't need to put all the strategy strength in countering China, we have to ensure that China remains a big rival in the Indian Ocean region through Africa. Now, we need to ensure to increase our socio-cultural cooperation. We can facilitate greater interaction. We can establish a National Center for African Studies approximately 15,000 to 25,000 African students study in India. We need to have a National Center for African Studies. We need to rename the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation and Indian uh, Council for Cultural Relations Scholarship after famous African figures because Africans, as they should be, as we have colonial relationship with Africa, as it should be, it is deeply and very enthusiastically supportive of their national icons. So we need to ensure that we are sending the right kind of message and this can be done through these very piecemeal yet very significant moves. All right, we need to implement the Roadmap 2030 vision. For this, we need a proper strategy and special mechanism consisting of important high level people such as the MEA and the National Security Council Secretariat to take care of the roadmap for 2030. There are so many areas where we can be cooperative, yet we choose to underexplore it. This should not be the attitude of India. India has, of course, gained a lot, but we can gain much more. Even Africa can gain much more from India. Now we come to the next part that is India and West Asia. Have you ever thought what is the difference between West Asia and the Middle East? Middle East and West Asia is the same region. But the nomenclature differs because of the optics. The West thinks it is to the middle of the East. That is why it is Middle East. India thinks it is in the Asia's West region. That is why it is West Asia. These kind of questions could also reflect in your interview. So the West Asia, we, as we are Indians, we are not going to call it Middle East, we are going to call it West Asia. West Asia comprises of many countries. Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Jordan. 
Israel, Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Oman and the rest. India has first and foremost the most fundamental relationship with this country as historically but in the contemporary times more so from the perspective of energy. This is an area which has provided us a lot of energy. Most of the development that India has done, has done it with the help of the energy that we gained from the West Asia region. Another very important prospect is whenever West Asia comes to your mind, just think of these things like, 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 like that it should be in your mind. Energy, then we have remittance. A lot of Indian diaspora goes to this area to earn money for itself, for themselves of course and for the uh, families that they have in India. We earn foreign exchange. After energy and remittance, what can you think of? Of course, trade, trade relations. And after the landscape has changed, after the signing of the Abraham Accords, Another very important agreement that was brokered by China. The landscape has changed. Most of the countries have stabilized their relationship here. So it becomes easier to cooperate with stable region rather than unstable region. All right. Energy, remittance, trade. For trade, of course, we need better connectivity. So you will link any area on certain premises. For West Asia, we have energy, we have remittance, we have trade relations, we have connectivity and we also have another very important thing. Just think what is it? Cultural cooperation. India is home to a huge Muslim population. A huge Muslim population gives India a lot of chance to capitalize on that. And as these countries are majorly Muslim dominated, we can also work through people to people contact and soft power that India has through our Muslims, through our Muslim brothers that reside in India. All right. So cultural energy, remittance, all these are a specific aspect of India's relationship with West Asia. This is a gist. Now let's start with the links that you can produce on your mains examination paper. Through the Indus Valley Civilization, we had relationship with Dilman. Dilman was nothing but Bahrain. We had trade relations. After that, in 6th century BC, Punjab was under Persian Empire, in Persian Empire. In 3rd century BCE, Egypt's Ptolemy II and the modern emperors. Chandragupta Maurya and Ashoka. They also exchanged ambassadors. Parsi was the language of the Mughal court and India's official language until 1835. These are our links with West Asia. Significance is from the first perspective always that comes to our mind in West Asia is energy. India's energy demands are gro growing. Our energy demand on a daily basis is approximately 40 to 50 gigawatt now. This is how fast we are growing. So we need to ensure that first of all we transition. Transition from conventional energy sources to renewable energy. Secondly, we also diversify our choices. We shouldn't be dependent on any one country. There is a change over here. I will start pronouncing that change while I get to this. So the Gulf, West Asia, North Africa region, it meets India's vast share of energy needs. Over 60% of India's total imports of crude oil. Since many times, we are not pronouncing the correct current ones, but since many years, this has been the strategy of India. Over 85% of India's LNG requirements are met through that. But now, Russia has been emerging the largest supplier of crude oil. As if we talk about the previous decade, uh, if we start from 2000 and, uh, you know, 2005 to 2014-15, it met, Saudi Arabia met 20% of India's needs valued at US dollars 21.8 billion. This was for the year 2014-15. 
you can also produce this data for right now the biggest supplier of crude oil is russia because we are getting cheaper crude oil from russia around 8 to 9 million indians are there in west asia approximately 2.6 million are in saudi arabia 2.5 million in united arab emirates 8 lakh in kuwait 7 in qatar and oman and 4 lakh in bahrain and they work in various fields they are in management field they are in medical technicians engineers it experts chartered accountant bankers workers domestic help these categories they have a huge respect in the country that they are serving in and the community has a really good outwardly appearance as they are law abiding people this has been said by many countries of the west asia the major diaspora of india in west asia goes from kerala first we have kerala then tamil nadu andhra pradesh gujarat karnataka punjab uttar pradesh bihar and west bengal and as i told you it is a law abiding community if we go by the report of united nations on international migration of 2017 the inward remittances from the gulf into india were 38 billion us dollars of course it will increase it has increased now this information has been sourced from the updated version of the ministry of external affairs okay moving on taken together gulf cooperation council member states along with the countries of the west asia north african region are india's largest trading partner in 2022 23 ua emerged as the third largest trading partner of india followed by saudi arabia so the landscape has been changing the uae india infrastructure investment fund it aims at a target of 75 billion us dollars to support investment in india's infrastructure also saudi aramco has 20% share in reliance industries oil business with an investment of 15 billion us dollars second is of course an aspect of trade that is investment uae is the first country in the region with which india has concluded a comprehensive economic partnership agreement so that our partnership becomes more strategic and all encompassing in nature more areas of trade have opened all right moving on now as i told you the landscape political landscape and international landscape amongst them is changing since the signing of the abraham accords which was brokered by the usa between israel and uae we were able to formulate our own i2 u2 what is i2 u2 it is a mechanism through which india israel uae and the usa interact with each other to ensure that economic growth political growth stability exist in the region as a whole and the recent detente that was brokered between saudi arabia and iran with the help of china all this has contributed to stabilization of that area when area is stable more investment and more trade will flow more people to people contact will grow more areas of cooperation will be developed so that is the reason with israel new delhi has forged a new partnership in defense and technologies using newer diplomatic constructs such as the i2u2 with iran new delhi continues its historic ties with the project such as the chabahar port which gives a gateway to the central asia as well as the west asia and the rest of the europe as well of course because of the sanctions by the usa we have had to for the reasons of the sanctions we have had to taper down our relationship and india needs to come back on its feet otherwise iran will continue to grow close to china and pakistan here we have to work independently there is of course a lot of challenge in this area as a whole first challenge is that there are many countries in west asia that are strife with instability that are in still the phase of civil war we can call about call uh, for syria iraq yemen it has gone from bad to worse because of so many proxy players that are there to fulfill their own gains countries such as usa russia they are plump, pumping in a lot of money and weapons and because of instability india cannot have a stable relationship with these countries the involvement of extra regional players has been a problem there is of course whenever there is a political vacuum there is no lawful authority unlawful authority will definitely come into place that happened with the birth of the icc there is saudi iran and israel rivalry which 
of course takes a toll on the India's independent relationship with each other. India-Israel close ties have worked not very much in favour uh, in the past but now it has started to change but still it will remain a thorn in the relationship that India has with Saudi Arabia. Not so much but still a bit. What should be the way forward? When we are dealing with West Asia, there are many things we have to keep in mind. First, we have to make political visits more frequent in order to show more closeness as it is geographically also very close to India. There was a 34 years of gap between 1981 and 2015 in visits by the highest level, Prime Minister specifically to the UAE. 34 years of gap. Now, we have seen that our Prime Minister frequently visits the West Asia. Ministerial and official level interaction should have a proper schedule so that we can say that we have a proper strategy and whenever there is a strategy, it shows the seriousness. We have to make concerted efforts to attract investment and we have to move beyond this buyer-seller relationship of energy. Also, we have to strengthen defense and security related interaction. If need be, India can also become a part of the brokering, although our policy doesn't you know, allow us to be a mediator right now because of neutrality. But if two countries, as India is emerging, they agree to us, we can also see that we can broker something between important countries. All right. We also have to facilitate the spiritual lives of Indians by giving Hajj and Umrah quotas more. Uh, of course, talking about uh, these particular quotas to different countries in West Asia, how we can increase our quotas. Okay. So I hope you understood the many aspects of India-Africa relationship and India-West Asia relationship. In the classes to come, I will focus upon India's relationship with the USA, which will be all-encompassing, not only trade, economic, cultural, defense, which is a very important and prominent pillar. We, are, we will also concentrate upon India's and Russia's relationship specifically after the war. All right. We will also make a lot of gains when it comes to India and China's relationship and other countries, India, Pakistan, India, neighboring countries will also be covered. So please do watch this class uh, whenever it uploads because it will be very, very helpful, extremely helpful for your mains 2023 and for your UPSC 2024 as well. Thank you so much for watching.